Alrighty. So, um, thank you very much for coming to this session. Um, we're here. This session is to talk primarily about containers, and we wanted to uh, to kick off uh, with something quite exciting and interesting. And that's exciting and interesting means a demonstration, demonstration of the entire internet modeled in containers and live migration and application. So I'd like to introduce Tycho Anderson. Tycho is part of the Ubuntu Server Solutions team. Um, he's actually well known in the canonical Ubuntu community for being the tallest engineer on the team. Um, uh, so with, with, that, with that power, he's going to demonstrate um, uh, uh, the internet in containers. Thank you, Tycho. Uh, hi. So um, what I'm uh, about to give a talk about, uh, there, there's uh, a colleague of mine who's based in Montreal who runs a small security conference there. And uh, what he was um, interested in doing for the security conferences, he wanted to have, uh, because uh, there's a lot of attacks on the internet itself, we've all heard of like BGP routers getting screwed up somehow. And so he wanted to build the whole internet so that his little security conference could attack it and play with it. Um, so uh, what, what he did was he, he, he built uh, the internet uh, using LXC. Or LXC um, and... Uh, he built it using unprivileged containers because uh, this was a security conference. He didn't, of course, want uh, the, the attackers who may be attacking the internet could also attack the containers and take over his host. That would also be bad. So uh, everything that you're seeing here is uh, unprivileged containers using uh, the user namespace technology. Um, so uh, what I have here is a picture uh, that uh, shows all of the sort of, there's 250, I think, core BGP routers uh, here. Um, and this is a, a picture of how they're all hooked up together inside. Uh, this is all running on my laptop here. Um, and so you'll notice, first of all, that there's no links across the Pacific. That's just because the JavaScript software doesn't support that, so he didn't put those in. Um, so you get some sort of interesting behavior when you're uh, processing, when you're doing trace routes and things like that inside the internet. Um, so the, the first thing that I'd like to show is um, just the uh, memory usage uh, yeah, I guess you guys, can everybody see that? Um, this, the, the containers here uh, take up about uh, 1,800 uh, megabytes of memory. Um, so there's 250 containers here, so that's about 7 megabytes uh, per container. And that's, uh, again, unprivileged containers, and that's a full Ubuntu, so you can log into all of them and, you know, app get install whatever you want or do uh, anything, you know, that you're interested in. So um, the next uh, thing is that I'm going to go pick this router somewhere here. So this is the Vancouver router, which is uh, on, on basically on one end. And uh, so I'd like to log into that one. He has uh, another thing I should mention is this script is called the internet. Um, so you can go to GitHub and clone this script, and you can make one of these yourself. There's, uh, there's a little bit of setup for the unprivileged containers, but then after that, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so, so what I just did there was I attached to the particular container this container that was in th that is you know Vancouver, and so now I'd like to uh, pick some other um, container, say this one in Cape Town, uh, called cto.linuxcon.ctf, and uh, so what we see here is this is a trace route of. Uh, the containers um, you can you can see from walking from the router that I was logged into all the way to this one in Cape Town, um, and this is the the latencies here are simulated latencies using uh, some kernel features in 316, um, and so you can see that if you look at the bottom here, if you can read it, it says that uh, the latency to Cape Town is about 370 milliseconds from Vancouver, and I asked the only guy that I know from Cape Town, Mark Shuttleworth, uh, if that was correct, and he said yes. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, there you have it. Um, and now, I'll turn it over to Dustin. All right. Thank you, Tycho. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's dive into a little bit of content about containers. And we'll start with Docker. This is the classic hockey stick chart that every VC investor and every startup founder is looking for. Uh, you can see up until about 2013, anyone searching for Docker was looking for pleated khaki pants. And then about 2013, bam, straight into the stratosphere. And that is what's happening right now uh, in our industry around this concept of Docker. 
I said it again, doctor. Durka, durka, durka. Ah, durka, durka. Um, it's just there's so much doctor out there right now in the in the world. There, there's meetups in in your hometown and every. And every, uh, and every tech city anywhere has hundreds of people, people you know, that'll fill a room uh, just to hear what's new and hot and next about Docker. In particular, Ubuntu loves Docker. We love Docker within the Ubuntu community. The, the development side of what we're doing in Ubuntu, our users also love Docker. We've made it the easiest, simplest way to install Docker and run Docker. It's three simple commands. App get installed, grab an Ubuntu image, Docker run, and boom, you're dropped into a shell inside of a Docker container that fundamentally is an Ubuntu image. And the inverse is true as well. Docker users, Docker developers also love Ubuntu. There's been over a million downloads of the Ubuntu image that have been retrieved from the Docker repository. And as Mark said in, in his in his, uh, his talk just a minute ago, that's six X, that's six times as many downloads as the next closest base image. Let that sink in for a minute, that's incredible. That really is powerful. And why is this happening? Well, Docker's built this incredible ethos around what it takes to build applications and what is the best way to deploy applications and what is the best way to administer applications. And so, you know, there's this entire mindset that is core to everything that's going to happen around a Docker deployment where, you know, the developers are building their applications, but they're packaging them as containers, as self-contained, shippable mechanisms that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much of, it's, it's, it's really self-containing everything that it takes to move that application around from cloud to cloud, from host to host, uh, from platform to platform. From a sysadmin perspective, being able to deploy those applications and have all the system dependencies bundled together and then expose a single port and boom, that service is up and running. And then the Docker Hub, the repository, the place where we pulled these numbers from, that's how people share their work. And it's really a beautiful model. It's, it's got this, this perfectly cyclic uh, approach to building applications. The perfect Docker file looks something like this. And what's beautiful about this is that it's so easy. We're talking 15 lines of, of code here, uh, most of which is white space and comments. Um, it's simply start from a base image, in this case Ubuntu 1204, install whatever it takes to run that service, in this case Apache, set up whatever environment variables and users you might need, expose a port, and then this last line is the real magic. Run a command. That command is the only thing running inside of that container. Excuse me, that is PID1 inside of that container. Uh, child processes that might fork off might also be running, but what you don't see here is a boot process. This container didn't, didn't boot up. Um, what you don't see here um, are TTYs or, or, or an SSH uh, terminal um, or any of init. There's no upstart, there's no systemd, there's no sysv init. It's simply that Apache binary running inside of that container. And it's beautiful from a security perspective. But Docker is fundamentally not a hypervisor. Um, you talk to any, anyone uh, at Docker and they will explain to you that Docker is really an application distribution mechanism. It's a way of, of, of building apps, shipping apps, containing those apps, and then ultimately deploying those apps. And frankly, it's, it's fantastic at doing that. And we love it for what it, what it is in doing that. What Mark introduced in the first session is what we're calling a new hypervisor. Full system containers, high performance. It feels like a VM, it boots, there are TTYs, there is an SSH daemon, it has the entire experience of everything that you'd expect from a full system virtualization, like a, like a KVM or like a Zen, but it's all happening inside of a container. Design with security as the first and foremost design principle. Um, that work is based on the user namespaces, which is upstream in the Linux kernel. It's some work that, that we've been leading. Um, it utilizes seccomp to confine the syscalls that a container uh, might need or have access to. App Armor for mandatory access controls around the, the profile of that, of that container. 
Um, and we're actually working with hardware vendors on the next iteration of CPU features for hardware-assisted containerization. So it, it's, it's similar technology that's on the roadmap. As soon as it's available in the silicon, it will be available in Ubuntu as well. Live migration is a core tenant to, uh, to a proper container hypervisor. It has to be smooth, fast, and reliable. It has to come up uh, uh, as, as quickly as possible. Minimize that downtime between uh, when a service migrates from one place to another. Uh, we're talking fractions of a second uh, downtime. Um, in the demo that we're going to demo, or in the demo that Tycho is going to show here in a second, it'll be a little bit longer than that, but you'll see why. Um, Live migration is so important to everything that we're doing in the cloud, and containers provide a fantastic mechanism for, for doing that at scale. Speaking of scale, density. Density is what we're hearing from, from every customer that we're talking to. They want to maximize the amount of density of guests per hardware. And by customers, I mean service providers, typically. Uh, the service providers want as many um, units on a given system as realistically possible without degrading, you know, as long as you, know, you can still manage the, the, the service level agreements and without degrading the experience of, of other users. Containers mean more density. There's less overhead than the full virtualization stack, and that translates into more instances and more efficiency. Performance. Um, we're, we, we, still, we love KVM. We love what KVM does. We love the performance of KVM. Um, but we've seen numerous white papers at this point comparing KVM and Zen to the performance of LXC, Docker, and other container solutions. Uh, and containers give you as close to native hardware performance as possible, as, as theoretically possible. The overhead is essentially zero at, at this point. So Mark introduced in the first session uh, the new extension to LX, uh, LXC, which we're calling LexD. It's a persistent daemon. It's a daemon that runs on a system. So you, you take a system and you'd have to get install uh, LexD, and now the LexD daemon is running on that system, and it's managing the containers on that, on, that, on that host. So it's acting as a hypervisor. It's also providing a REST API, and it, does that over a, it can do that over a remote network uh, or a local socket. Uh, and this is important when you want to tie LexD into a Nova Compute or some other management engine, perhaps uh, you know, beyond uh, OpenStack. It's also going to introduce, or it also is introducing a more powerful, graceful CLI, and we're reworking the LexC CLI as well. If, if you're familiar with LexC right now, there's 20-something commands. They're all L, uh, LexC dash something. We're throwing that away. We're taking the Git style approach where there's one command, an action verb, and then, then dependent parameters upon that. We've, we've, really, we've really improved the, the command line experience for LexC and LexD both. Core to that live migration, snapshot, checkpoint, migrate, restart. Snapshot, checkpoint, migrate, restart. That's how you move a machine back and forth. And that's based on the upstream Linux kernel work around Checkpoint restart. You may you may see talks or hear about CRIU, C R I U. Um, that's checkpoint restart. There's a bit more to it than just checkpoint restart. You've also got to to migrate as well. Secure by default. That that is again something we've heard from every customer we've talked to. Multi tenancy is king in OpenStack environments and service provider environments. Uh, that security has to be there. Um, and there's quite a bit of work around, especially the network stack, to, to make that happen. And that's all work that is uh, currently in progress, and we're, we're making good progress on it. The other piece, I mentioned network, is storage. Dynamic, extensible. It has to be able to be uh, tied into other systems, into uh, hardware provided, software-defined storage, software-defined networking, and being able to tie that and use that inside of containers is, is oh so important. Lastly, uh, it's worth mentioning that this work is all uh, currently implemented in Go. Um, we've had a tremendous experience with Go, uh, working in Go on Juju, the performance, the concurrency, uh, the security of the language, um, the, the, the built-in network primitives, the fact that there's a web server that you can start running in, in a line or two of, of Go code makes the that, that REST API, a, a very simple extension of everything else that that daemon is providing. We found some of the smartest and best 
cloud savvy developers in the world are working in Go, and it's it's really a pleasure working with that community and working with those people. So the other half of this is Nova Compute aspect of it. It's currently released in OpenStack uh, Juno, uh, which released a, a, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, we were trying to save the fanfare for, for this week. Um, the previous code name of, of Lexi and LexD was Flex, and so it landed in OpenStack Juno, in Ubuntu OpenStack Juno, as Nova Compute Flex. Um, you can actually start instances, if you're running uh, Ubuntu OpenStack Juno, you can start instances as uh, LXC containers, LXC containers at this point. Uh, we call it a tech preview in that uh, we did not get it upstream for, for, for Juno, but we're currently working on upstreaming that work for, for Kilo. This is the beginning of the summit, the beginning of the cycle for Kilo, and this work is absolutely going upstream into, uh, into OpenStack for, for Kilo. So Nova schedules the instances as full system containers. What that means is from a, a end user or a sysadmin's perspective, uh, you know, you're launching instances and they're landing inside of containers inside of, instead of KVM or Zen. And all the benefits that might come with that, the density and the performance, of course, also the ability to run on non-Intel 64 hardware. So, uh, you know, power, uh, ARM, other architectures uh, certainly come into play when you're talking containers and you're not dependent on hardware provided or hardware assisted virtualization. The images that it boots are straight from Glance. Uh, that's beautiful. You're seeing the pattern here, right? These instances work just like any other instance in, in OpenStack itself. The networking is provided by, by Neutron. Um, this involves quite a bit of work around Neutron and, and LXC so that uh, containers can draw that, that, that IP address and floating IP and, and so forth and handle the, the mapping and the, the tunnels. Um, that's, that's all work that we leverage from, from Neutron. We're currently working on uh, utilizing the storage that Swift, Ceph, Sender, all the, the various storage mechanisms from, from OpenStack, uh, funneling that into the instance which is running inside of a container. All right, so you just heard from Dustin about uh, lots of uh, real hypervisor stuff. Um, so now I would like to show you some real hypervisor stuff. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is container migration. Um, so just to give you a little heads up about what's going to happen. Um, so I, I, uh, I have two hosts. Um, they're connected by a network, and then I'm also going to connect to the host. Uh, and then I'm going to have some containers on one of the hosts, and I want to migrate one of the containers from one host to the other. Uh, and then I will try to migrate it back. Uh, and then we'll see how all this works. Um, so in the spirit of, as Mark said, taking our life into our hands, um, I'm going to try this. And so I hope you all uh, bear with me. Um, so uh, what I have here is uh, on top, on, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see on the top, there's host one. Uh, it's just running the LXC, uh, LXC info command. So it, it's telling you right now the container has stopped. And the, on the bottom, that's host 2. And it's also running the LXC info command that's telling you the container's not running there either. So I'm, on, I'm logged into host 1 now. So, so I'll start this container. And uh, it comes up. And then uh, I will just go ahead and try and migrate this container. Um, and so. The tool that we're using to do this migration is a tool called Criu uh, that I've been contrib contributing to for the last uh, six or eight months. Um, and I've, I've also done a Lexi wrapper around that tool that migrates some other stuff that uh, Criu doesn't necessarily know about. So, um, uh, so basically what you saw there is it went from the top to the bottom and uh, it uh, migrated everything. The, the container's now running uh, on the, the bottom host and then I can run this and migrate it back. Um, and Sometimes it takes a, a little while. I have basically done no work on optimizing this process at all. So this is really just checkpoint rsync restore. So there's no uh, iteration or anything. Um, so that's very cool. I can migrate a container. Um, but uh, what you guys are all interested in work, uh, what you guys are all interested in are workloads. Um, and so I have sort of an unusual workload that I really like. important workload. Yeah. Uh, so I actually don't. Uh, uh, I, I know that this is a big cloud conference, and so I probably should have done a cloud workload. Um, but I'm a little bit of a rebel, so I'd like I'd like to do this. 
I don't know if any of you guys remember this. This was a video game that came out a while ago. Uh, uh. <laughs> so um, what I like to do, so this is a VNC, and I'm running uh, Doom inside this Linux container. Actually, I have a web server running here, too, so I, I could show you. I could wget some stuff, but I figured this might be more interesting. <laughs> so um, what I like to do is migrate this container and so you'll see the Doom freezes and it does its thing and it, it stops on the on that one host and then Doom comes back wow. uh, and then it, and then it runs. Um, that's sort of the reaction that I had when I first saw. Actually, I said some other things that I probably won't say here, um, but uh, th th this is uh, it's pretty cool stuff. So you can uh, migrate it back to. Um, so this is these are the sorts of things that we're going to bring to you uh, with LexD is uh, the kinds of technologies. Uh, probably you won't use it to play Doom, but you might use it to do so, some other stuff that's maybe worth some more money. So, um, yes? Uh, yeah, so it's just uh, what it says here. Yeah, 29 meg, yep. So uh, this, this is, it's uh, running in a frame buffer because actually Cryu right now does not support dumping arbitrary devices. Um, so this, which is one reason that I can't do sound here, um, because we don't support dumping sound devices uh, or video devices. Um, so patches are of course welcome. Uh, there's a Cree plugin engine, so if you are you have your own custom device that you want to use, you can write a plugin to Cree to dump that device. Um, or I, like I say, I've been working with Upstream as well, and they're they're very uh, open to patches and things. So um, that's the coolest thing I can do today. <laughs> Internet in a box and live mi migration <laughs> of, of Doom. Of Doom. Of VN uh, X server. Cool. Any other questions? Go ahead. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. Uh, those containers in VMs versus uh, LXC or LXC, LXC versus bare metal. Right, so I can refer you to two white papers that we've studied, one from IBM that uh, was published this year comparing, um, comparing KVM to containers, Docker uh, specifically, and then there's a second one from a university in Brazil. Um, it was, a, it was a, a graduate white paper comparing uh, Lexi to uh, LXC to uh, Zen, okay? Um, and in both cases, the conclusion, the short of it was um, containers perform better than full vert hypervisors, KVM and, and Zen. Uh, in some cases, they were about the same, but certainly never any worse. Um, and in, in particular workloads, it performed at bare metal, at bare metal speed. So depending on your workload, um, IO being one that really benefits, especially disk access, really benefits from having direct access to, to the, the hardware as you would in, t in a container. I mean, you can always set up VMs to have you know, full access to block devices. Um, but in, in that case, so IO workloads, you're talking you know, Hadoop or big data, you know, and th that whole suite of NoSQL databases, um, really, good, uh, really good use cases for, that, for, that, for that, that native performance. The other thing that we've seen, you know, I, I mentioned several times security and multi-tenancy being very, very important. And we've heard that from a number of, particularly our, our uh, ISP type customers, where multi-tenancy is, is so important to them. We've also seen a whole other class of, of customers where the, the noisy neighbor problem isn't nearly as big of a deal, or even the hostile neighbor problem isn't nearly as big of a deal. For the most part, in their workloads, everyone running on that machine is sitting around the same cube or in the same room, more or less. Um, in which case, the, the multi-tenancy thing, thing isn't nearly as important. Someone stepped on your toes, you know, knock them over and start a new container or something like that. So getting you know, hacked by, your, by the next IP over isn't as much of an issue. Um, that said, we're still desperately are, uh, keenly focused on the, on, the, on, the, on the security aspect as well. In the back. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I 
Let's add that in, Tycho. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. C groups and namespaces totally, totally go together. Uh, glossed over that one. Um, C groups and namespaces are really the two fundamental technologies that make LXC and, and LXC and LXD possible. Um, I highlighted some of the other ones in that that's, um, that, that tends to be the, the, you know, our focus. But yes, yeah, C groups are so important uh, to everything a container does. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, back to the, the portability uh, story for containers. Another beautiful thing about containers, as I said, it runs well on non-Intel 64-bit architectures. And I mentioned ARM and PowerPC. I neglected that it also runs well inside of a, 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 a KVM, inside of a virtual machine. Um, there you are, you know, you will pay the some penalty for the for the for the full virtualization however being able to run multiple workloads inside of a vm is a, 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 an extremely powerful and useful scenario on every one of these orange boxes uh, mark used uh, deployed kubernetes on on this one we're going to use these two in uh, in demos coming up soon but we are packing workloads very densely on either the physical servers each one's rec there's 10 of them in here each one is represented by uh, a light when we need to pack more than 10 services to deploy something like a Hadoop, like a OpenStack, like a Cloud Foundry, we're we're co-locating services on machines, and we're doing that inside of LXC, not inside of of, of VMs. There's uh, OpenStack is running on this machine, which we're going to use momentarily, and on one of the nodes we've got MySQL inside it of a container, Rabbit inside of a separate container on the same machine. Uh, Keystone on, on that machine, and the dashboard on that machine. Four separate containers, one piece of hardware, four different IP addresses. Each one is you know, addressed independently as a unit, and that's giving us fantastic performance of each of those components, but also you know, densely packed onto one system. And then that gives us nine other systems that we can you know, put more interesting workloads on, maybe a Nova computer or something. Yes, sir? A mixed hypervisor, uh, so like a Nova Compute that's hosting both KVM and and LexD. Yeah. Good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, let me get back with you on that one. I'll give, I'll give you a card. Yes, sir. Local storage only. In, in, the, in the tech preview that, w that we released you know, two, two weeks ago, it's a local, it's your local disk. It's whatever you've provisioned that flavor uh, to have from a local, local, local disk. So that, that disk image is getting migrated as well. Right, mm -hmm. right. The disk image is part of that, that rsync that, that moves over, right. Yes, sir. Migrating across clouds. Uh, I do, I, there's no reason you couldn't do it. I guess it would just be slow. Um, uh, at the core, there's a sorry. At, at the core, there's an rsync of the mm -hmm. base data. Um, then you pause the mm -hmm. system. You do another rsync of anything that might have changed during your first rsync, and then the memory of the system is moved over, as well as processor states and and processes mm -hmm. and anything else. A, right. a bit of accounting. So if you're if you're willing to pay the you know slowness cost, uh, then absolutely of the WAN of going over a WAN, right? right. What we were doing here was over a, a gigabit connection. Yep. You know. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Dustin. Thank you, Tycho. Mm -hmm. Probably the best demo you'll see all day. <laughs> So we have finished a little early, um, but I know a few people are asking about the schedule because they didn't see it. Just for your information, it is on the screen outside the, uh, uh, the door here, but coming up straight after lunch, so that'll be at, um, uh, well, at the end of lunch, we're going to have um, Extreme OpenStack. So Mark referenced um, some of the performance testing work that we've, uh, we've just completed recently, spinning up OpenStack on 500 plus nodes, some of the lessons learned there with Juno and some of the enhancements in Neutron. Um, server tech lead, uh, Canonical, James Page, is going to be running through that. Just one so um, if you're interested in learning about performance tuning in OpenStack and some of the enhancements in Juno, please come back straight after lunch. Thank you.